Hey everybody, this is Peter Diamandis, uh, back with the next edition of Exponential Wisdom with my dear friend Dan Sullivan. Dan, good to see you. Ah, I'm so excited, Peter, about this one because one of my other strategic coach 10 times clients is the number one IVF doctor, in vitro fertilization doctor in the United States, Stephen Palter. So he's ranked number one in the United States. Well, let's tell them what the subject is going to be. Uh, They weren't listening to last time. The most exciting breakthrough in that world that you've written blogs on is actually the CRISPR technology, which up until now, they've more or less felt that the cards you have are the cards that you're dealt. As far as gene goes, and now there's some thought that maybe (laughs) if you get a lousy card, you can actually change it from a two to an ace. So it's a fascinating area, and it affects every single area of society. It affects ethics, morality, religion, politics, culture, everything. Well, let me give some context, because I don't think we've done that yet. We're here to talk on this session about the implication of reproduction and sex given exponential technologies. Yes. And as I think about that, every exponential technology is going to change that. There's, it's said we spend the most time of our lives thinking about sex as a percentage of our thought process. And it's one of the most important things that we do as a species to reproduce and pass on our genome. And so when you think about that, and we all know that the pornography industry has driven a lot of the technology from the VHS to the internet. And so as new technologies come online, pornography is going to drive that adoption. But, you know, that's part of the story. The other part of the story, of course, is how we reproduce. And what I've been thinking about is the notion that the old way of reproducing, which is a man and woman get together, in or out of wedlock, and they have a child, and when you mix the sperm with eggs, you have this Mendelian genetics that randomly, this new life form as a random combination of genes from the mother or from the father, and you're basically leaving the fate of your children to randomness. There is an argument to be made that when we have kids, when we have a family, we want to give our family the best education, the best food, the best clothing, the best we can offer as a parent. And the question is, why wouldn't we start by offering our child the best genetic material to start with? And this brings up, as you said, this entire moral ethical debate going back to sort of World War II, Aryan race conversations and so forth. But man, oh man, IVF, Stephen Poulter, one of the leaders in the world on this. But even more than that, the ability now to have a child without having an egg Mm -hmm. or eventually being able to clone yourself or being able Mm -hmm. to edit the genome of the child to remove diseased genes. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is that people say, oh, I hate the idea of that or I love the idea of that. But the actual reality is that hundreds and thousands of breakthroughs are being made as we sit here doing the podcast. So it's a reality that's going to become everyday reality as we go forward. The one thing about technology convergence, there's actually no one in charge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, isn't there a number I can call to, uh, you know, actually put in a complaint here? I want to slow things down. Well, We live in a world where there's actually, if you really wanted to tell the truth about it, nobody's in charge of this world, (laughs) except with their interest and what they're moving forward personally. Yeah. And even if you wanted to slow it down, you know, like when under Bush 41 or 43, whatever it was, stem cell research using fetal cell was made illegal. All it means is that the research and the researchers and the money go offshore to someplace else. The U.S. goes from being number one to number eight, and now it's in South Korea or China. Yeah. The book I've read the most is a book called The Technological System by a French sociologist. It was written in 1980, and he said, you know, up until now, technology has been contained within countries. And he said the big switch that's happening right now is that all the countries are now inside the technology. (laughs) So the thing that people don't realize is that in a very real respect, there is world, I won't say world government, but there's, there's world innovation that is irrespective of borders. 
And wherever talent pops up, wherever new ideas pop up, and they have the capability to act on it, it's going to be acted on. And the reason is because no one's in charge of what's happening. Each person has their own step. So just three things, Peter, that you see happening within the next 12 months that's going to be quite startling to everybody, just from your own knowledge of where things are right now. Yeah. So talking about in this focus on reproduction, Just some of the stats here and what's going on. First of all, we now have the technology to freeze a woman's eggs so that a lot of times women felt this incredible pressure to have a child before, you know, mid thirties and it's choose between a family and a career. But you can imagine now that as a woman, you're able to actually freeze your eggs, freeze your core genetic material and have a baby when you're 45 or 50. Of course, the other thing going on is volunteer women who will incubate your child. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got this entire spectrum, the sexual revolution or the reproduction revolution that is I can use my eggs or a volunteer egg for IVF. I can carry the child or I can have someone else carry the child for me. There's work going on in artificial wombs. So it's not another person, but an artificial womb that's carrying uh, your child to full term. We've got... A few other key things that's going on right now, just checking my notes here, of course, designer babies where where it's going to begin first is I go through IVF and I will fertilize maybe 15 or 20 eggs. I'll allow those eggs to go from a single fertilized cell to a blastocyst, maybe having 15 or 20 cells in a ball, and then I'll pluck one of those cells from each of the 20 fertilized eggs and I will do a gene sequence on each of those. So I say, look, of the 20 eggs, these five don't carry the disease I'm trying to protect against. And I'm gonna take that fertilized egg and put it in. Mm -hmm. The other option, of course, is you fertilize one egg and you use CRISPR-Cas9, this gene editing system that has just exploded onto the scene. Billions of dollars of research going in, where I go in and I repair that fertilized egg. I take out the bad gene, I put in the new gene, and then I take that to term. And what I've effectively done is I've eliminated that gene from the gene line of my family. Mm -hmm. Other amazing things going on right now is we are now making babies with more than two people, meaning I may have the mother and the father donating the somatic DNA. And what has just been done is where a third person donates the mitochondrial DNA, going, taking you back to your high school biology, we have our 23 chromosomes, But we also, in our mitochondria, we have a whole new set of mitochondrial DNA. And your mitochondria are your power source of your body. And so you might want to get a much more efficient or disease-free power source. So you can get a idealized mitochondria that you plug in, and that mitochondria then is fast-forwarded. And then the idea of actually making babies without eggs. And this, of course, is for gay couples who will have the genetic information from two, if you would, male fathers and being able to create a viable embryo from that. That research is going on. So all of these areas are reinventing this idea of human reproduction. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. What's really interesting, just a little bit of background to this, Stephen has created this amazing communication platform, this is Stephen Palter, which is called Lodestone. And it's all the top IVF doctors in the world, they get together it's usually a particular night of a week every month. Then he gets sponsors who actually get the right to observe what's being talked about. And he went to the big pharma companies. They weren't interested. He went to the big medical technology companies. And all the people who signed up as sponsors were startup genetics companies. So all the money that got poured into finding out what IVF doctors are thinking about in their practice, what they see as the frontiers of issues, all the money is being poured in by exactly the people that you're talking about who are creating the breakthrough technologies here. Absolutely. You know, we've talked about sort of the technologies that are going to give us the ability to have children at different stages of life, different couples Mm -hmm. and disease free and all this is really important. I think there's a version of the future. I don't know if it's 10 years or 50 years from now, but where the idea of having a child in the old fashioned way is sort of frowned upon because why would you take such risks 
on planning your family, right? Of mm -hmm. letting it randomly. And it's interesting because morals and ethics change, right? Right. The example I give is if someone has a massive heart attack today and they need a heart transplant, that's a miracle today to take the heart out of a dead person and put it into a live person mm -hmm. and save their life. Yeah. A thousand years ago, that would have been the work of the devil. Yes. <laughs> and so ethics do change a lot over time. I think there's many, many forces besides science and technology that uh, come into play because people have to live day-to-day -day lives. Things have to be paid for and everything. But, you know, I had the advantage, Peter. I grew up in the 1940s. And when I was eight years old, I had this series of running conversations with a 78-year-old neighbor who had been born in the 1870s. I would just sit there by the hour and say, you know, what's it like to grow up on a farm where there's no electricity, there's no tractors, there's... She had no television, she had no radio, she had no... And I came to the feeling that in her 78 years, she had gone through profound, profound changes, and yet, you know, Running a farm was pretty much the same. There was new technologies, there was new ways of going about getting things to the market and everything else. So I had this view of 70 years back when I was eight years old, and I said, you know, probably it's gonna be all change in the future. And I think that's where my sense of flexibility as an individual and just keeping myself open really came from because People are people, and there are certain things which don't change. It's the Jeff Bezos thing. Tell me the stuff that isn't going to change. But people are still going to love their children. They're still going to have a partner in life that they love. And if you can eliminate a lot of the risks that are associated, I mean, if you had an impaired child and you were given a second do at it, like you could reset the clock, go back, if you could remove the thing that impaired that child, how many parents would raise their hand out of 100 if they were given the opportunity to do it? And they would. You know, the other side of the equation here from reproduction is sex. It's human desire, sexual drive. And bringing up two five-year-old boys, I think about this. I remember when I first saw as a teenager and saw my first Playboy magazine, and it was like, oh, my God, you know, mm -hmm. it was like, but today, we've got, obviously, pornography for free, pretty rampant and available anywhere on the planet, and it's changing social norms, and it's actually changing. People are now having families later and later, I think in part as a result of their ability to get physical fulfillment other places. And so, obviously, the internet and video streaming and the ability to do very low cost video capture and memory being free and bandwidth being free and all of this has created this digital pornography, I'll call it revolution or explosion. But I think we haven't seen anything yet because VR is going to come on where you are in a full 3D immersive environment. And part of that is going to be where the 3D people you're interacting with aren't actual people, they're AIs rendered by a quantum computer or rendered by, you know, massive computing power. So I think about how is that going to change society where I can get any type of experience and gratification in a VR space, just make my wildest, craziest desires. And I think about as a father of two boys, that's the world they're living into and how is that going to impact them? So it's concerning in many ways, oh, yeah. but just to put on the table. What thinking processes will always be useful? I just focus on thinking processes. I mean, people have unlimited choice, but part of the problem is they can't focus on one thing. So I think that there's a counterbalance to all of this. I'm noticing, for example, social media. I've been tracking the social media numbers. And the actual use of social media on an individual basis over time actually goes down because realize that their friends on social media aren't actually like a live human friend that they actually have. See, my feeling is that there is a human nature that does not get changed by capability, circumstances, and everything else. And my goal, you know, inside Coach is, doesn't matter what industry you're in, What's it take to be a really successful entrepreneur? And it's all pretty much the same stuff from one industry to the next. So your mastermind group that you get together, your moonshot group, 
they still got the problem every day. You know, my latest thing is using procrastination to focus your mind. I bet there's a lot of things they're procrastinating on, you know, and I can teach them how to use procrastination as a way of breaking through. So it's a nice balance between us because you get to do all this exploring for me, and then I get to take all your free time for you. <laughs> and I sit there, I go, yeah, I wonder what Peter's doing today. Oh, I think I'll go for a walk. But it's still going to be humanity, and humanity's gone through a lot of stuff over 100 million years or whatever we're on a planet, and this is just the latest phase. That is true. Things are changing faster and faster, but we still are humans. So. Yep. One of the things I want to talk about next time is a subject that I'm excited about, which is this idea of human intelligence, HI. That'd be a fun exploration with you and me. What is it like going through our lives if all of a sudden we have AI on the brain and we have infinite capacity and thinking? How would our lives change? That'd be a fun conversation. I'll put some thought into that one before because... You know, I've spent 43 years just trying to figure out how entrepreneurial (laughs) brains work. You know, I've got some patterns that I've really come up with. So I think that that would be a good subject matter to apply the new breakthroughs that you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. All right, Dan, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.